Sayın Dekanım, değerli hocalarım, sevgili arkadaşlar, sevgili meslektaşlarım, hepiniz hoş geldiniz. Bugün burada e, uluslararası tanınırlığı hayli fazla, ünlü bir etikçiyle bir birlikteyiz. E, ben e, başlangıçta birkaç cümle İngilizce, Sonra size Daryl Mason'ın e, özgeçmişini kısaca anlatmak isterim. E, Daryl Mason, değerli hocalarım, sevgili arkadaşlar, benim de kendisi mentorumdur. Ve Amerikan University of Southern Nations isimli Amerika'da ki bir üniversitenin hem prezidentı yani kurucusu hem de hala başkanıdır. Kendisi uzun yıllar UNESCO'nun Asya biriminde görev yapmıştır. Kendisi esas olarak lisans eğitimini biyolojici alanında almıştır. Arkasından Cambridge Üniversitesi'nde genetik üzerine bir, bir, bir doktorasını tamamlamıştır ve arkasından Fumamoto yani işte, Japonya'da felsefede alanında yine işte, doktorasını e, tamamlamıştır. Kendisi 300'den fazla akademik <gülüyor> makalenin editörü veya bizzat işte, yazarıdır ve 45'ten fazla da Biyoetik alanındaki kitabın editörü veya bizzat o kitaplar yazarıdır. Kendisi biyoetik alanında tüm dünyada kanınan ve bazı açılımlardan kendisinin düşünceleri felsefe yani biyoetik titiklik camiasında takip edilen bir akademisyendir. İşte biz bugün Hocamızla birlikte buradayız ee, ve we will listen his speech, his talk about bioethics, the, culture, the culture of peace and the responsibilities of medical professionals. It means that after COVID-19 pandemic, The responsibilities of medical professions is so important that it was not even that. So, I wish to invite Prof. Daniel Mazur with your huge applause to the stage. Thank you very much, Hassan, for introducing me so generously. Thank you for sharing this time together. Uh, I'd like to stimulate our discussion together about these themes, the bioethics, the culture of peace, and the responsibilities of medical professionals. I. My view about bioethics is the love of life is affected by my ontology, my history. I'm a social construct of living and working with others in Christchurch, my hometown in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in Cambridge, in the UK, in Tsukuba Science City in Japan, in Rome, in Bangkok, in Southern California and Arizona, and significant time in about another 60 countries of the world. I want to give thanks to everyone and all creatures I've uh, been with. The activity of science is not ethically neutral. Scientists are human. Science is based on assumptions such as the falsifiability hypothesis 
or some enlightenment mentality that modern science is better than traditional wisdom and practices that are driven by religious and political ideals. On this slide, I think I made a mistake. I said scientists are humans. You may remember in the last 12 months, a very famous video taken of a orangutan in uh, Indonesia, who after having a severe gash under their eye, made chewed leaves to make a herbal remedy, applied it as a poster to their cheek, and it healed much more quickly. And they repeated this formulation a couple of days later. This medicinal plant use, its processing, the biotechnological processing, is clearly the result of a scientific process. So actually scientists are not only human, I should say. But science is viewed as something to help us. Bioethics has, again, its origins. New technology has been a catalyst for re-examination of medical ethics and social ethics and international dialogue on ethical principles. As a former biochemist, I may use the word catalyst, and I think in the recent years, we have some other events in our social history that have also catalyzed us in our reflections, both nationally in Turkey and internationally in the world, and any opportunity to rethink ourselves is a chance to challenge. Professions have developed ways to identify themselves, such as medical ethics, dental ethics, environmental ethics, public health ethics, applied ethics, ethics of biotechnology, engineering ethics, and so on. Confucius said that to love a thing means wanting it to live. Do you agree with Confucius? Are we Chinese? Yes. Well, in fact, this may be a universal ethic. Love is a starting point. I lived half my life in Japan. And you could say that since I love sushi so much that my dream of heaven is a revolving sushi restaurant, that perhaps my proteins are mainly Japanese, my DNA comes from various <coughs> origins uh, around uh, our globe. This is a, when we say a prayer, we may tie it to uh, a note, for example, I believe yesterday was the first day of the new school year, so if you pray for, uh, maybe a few months ago you prayed for exams at the end of your last year, now you pray for exams, you may go to the shrine and pray, tie your prayer there. Or you pray for, I want to meet my dear love, or I wish my mother will not suffer from the disease that she's suffering from, or I wish for praying for peace in a very troubled world. All these prayers. Love of life is common. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, these are two foundational human rights treaties, both start with the same um, article. All peoples have a right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. If you know English, you may ask, well, why does it say all peoples? And if you know the United Nations, you may say, why doesn't it say all nations? Okay, well, when the United Nations was formed, there were only 50 nations in the world because of colonization. Most were still colonies in Asia and Africa. And still today, 
peoples, means sovereign peoples, there may be four or five thousand peoples or nations in the world, even though politically we only have just over 200 recognized nations, such as Turkey or the United States. Principles or ideals of bioethics, so the conventional language tries to think of all the different ethical principles. There may be some central ones, such as autonomy and justice, do no harm, beneficence. I use an alternative language, such as self-love, love of others, loving life, loving good. How do we balance these uh, two things? <coughs> Bioethics is a bridge. Uh, we need dialogue about diverse values and risk judgments. Um, so, how do we make these judgments about diversity? How do we balance which ethical principles are most important? So there are several ways to view ethics. One is descriptive ethics. It's the way people view life, their moral interactions, and responsibilities of living organisms in their lives. So I can describe your bioethic and my bioethic. Sometimes at the end of uh, your dear colleagues' examinations in medical ethics, they might ask you to describe ethics and simply since there's no right or wrong answer, you can say, I think this is the most important ethical principle, but you need to explain why. So if every answer is okay, is correct, as long as you explain why. But there are many principles, and we're going to talk about some of these, and how this may be helpful for us as uh, making decisions, both as citizens and as professionals. Instead of calling these principles, perhaps we can also call them ideals, because we can find exceptions to all of them. So balancing doing good and not doing harm. I want to pursue something really well, uh, it may cause harm. For example, you rushed to this lecture because you wanted to hear it and you broke the speed limit in the car or the motorbike. That was a benefit, but also a risk. Um, and possibly you squashed some beetle that was walking across the road that if you were a follower of Jain religion, uh, might have been very serious to you morally. Individual autonomy versus justice to all. We had a great lesson in this in public health in the, the last few years with our pandemic. Okay. And we also have this in terms of uh, sitting in the lecture room. You may feel like uh, shouting, I disagree with you, but because of your common sense, you justice to all, you're probably going to wait to the end and say, can I ask a question I disagree with that, Professor? So, we have a long heritage of this in biology, medicine, society, and religion all around the world. And for some reasons, we will see this heritage, our biological, social, and spiritual heritage of why we do ethics and why societies have tried to make some order for us to make life a little bit easier. I showed you about these uh, conventional principles. So descriptive ethics is one approach I can describe. A second way to view ethics is prescriptive ethics, is to tell others what's ethically good or bad, what principles are most important in making such decisions. It may also be to say that something or someone has rights and others have duties to them. And various <coughs> philosophers or lawyers or politicians have told us this is the right way to do things, and this is the wrong way. And in colonization, some countries said, you need to follow this. Okay, so when they, my ancestors in Rome, or went to Britain, and then my, then 
more recent ancestors in Britain went around the world, they thought that they were God's gift to the world. They thought they knew what they can do. They were prescribing ethics or normative ethics to say this is the right way of thinking. Imperialism, colonization. Do we want to do the same thing in medical ethics today? I don't think so. But at the same time, it's useful sometimes to have laws, but the examples I'm going to give in this lecture show that different countries, nations, and people have different laws about the similar to topics. And if we go from the prescription, which chooses one position, it's trying to find one position, even though descriptively we have all positions in every society. And this is one of the dilemmas for uh, ethics. Protecting the dignity of people is, I think, a universally agreed principle. So uh, we may protect the dignity of people at different stages. I would go from the principles to say that these are actually imperatives of love. And if you've read Immanuel Kant, he uses moral imperatives. I use imperatives of love. Ethical principles for loving good. Beneficence supports the development of science and technology that might cure sick persons or feed hungry people. This is not an option. Also, remember, actually for me, this is the most important ethical principle. And often the ethics is meant to be a brake, like the brake in your car, against science and technology. But actually, ethics is the foundation of why most of us do what we do. We're trying to make the world a bit better um, through science and technology. The ethical principle of loving life or do no harm warns us to do technology assessment on all options, current and new, to provide the best alternative for the local situation now. So we need to do assessment. We have uh, clinical trials of new medicines. We want to know if it's better to use biological pest control, chemical pesticides, or just let the insects eat a certain amount of our plants when we eat the food, which is better for us. An ethical principle of loving others, justice makes us consider the risks for future generations and for all to share in the fruits of scientific endeavor. Benefit sharing of technology, affordable health care for all poverty eradication. So it is an imperative. We have to love others. How do we do that in our world? Which is often governed by industry and uh, profit. Respect for the ethical principle of self-love supports the empowerment of people so they can access technology according to their values. And self-love is a little different to self-rule. But I would, you know, self-love, you have to love yourself. You're coming to school to study, but you balance that self-love of developing your capacity as a human being to serve beneficence, to love others, while also balancing love of others. And self-rule is not always the same. Sometimes I may make a decision which is actually against what is in my best interests. And there are some stages in our life where, and also sometimes as a health professional, when we have so much respect for autonomy, we may really judge, are you really thinking rightly? And sometimes, therefore, we may have to challenge uh, a person's decision. For example, uh, we have an ethical debate <coughs> you know, voluntary amputation of the arm. I don't want this arm anymore, I want to cut it off. Some people think like that. Autonomy would say, okay, your choice, you thought about it, you can do it. For me, it's uh, very challenging. I would probably want them to wait for six months to see, really psychologically, you don't want that arm, 
you've thought about the consequences and then express. But am I, am I imposing my paternalism on them? So these are some medical professions, um, you know, professional questions. When we visit a doctor to seek treatment, we have uh, on the left the doctor above the patient, the paternalism, like a father. Informed consent, doctor and the patient. Informed choice, the patient and the doctor. Because the patient is above the doctor. When I go to the supermarket to buy food or the pharmacy to buy drugs. So I lived for about 10 years in Thailand. In Thailand, I can go to the pharmacy and buy antibiotics or over the counter. So I always do that when I'm in Bangkok because in the United States or New Zealand or England, I can't go to the pharmacy and buy antibiotics without a prescription. Yeah? But here in Bangkok, I can do that even at the airport. I go to the Boots Pharmacy, which in Thailand, and so I can choose. I want you know, a few packets of this antibiotic and this antibiotic. I stock up and then I take it. I actually don't like to use antibiotics. I, touch wood, I really resist it. But it's useful for me and useful if I need to give to people because actually in some countries going to the doctor is really expensive to get a prescription. In the United States, for example. So in all societies there's a transition from paternalism and informed consent to informed choice. Is it always informed is the problem. Another ethical issue direct to the public advertising of pharmaceutical medical products. It's allowed in two very big, West, you know, two interesting Western countries, New Zealand and the United States. It's not allowed in many other Western countries. I don't know about Turkey, if the pharmaceutical company can directly advertise to the consumer drugs. No, it is not. Sometimes? Sometimes? Sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So in for some countries they do, and then is it always informed is a big question for ethics. International standards for bioethics. So could we find agreement in different countries? Well, As an academic, I was involved in <coughs> UNESCO International Bioethics Committee in the human, time of the Human Genome Project. We drafted the Universal Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights as a set of ethical principles that might apply to how we deal with the genome. And uh, in 2005, the Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights was adopted which is a much more broader document, and it includes a set of at least 15 different principles that are common. Every country in the world agreed to these. Okay? So North Korea agrees, China. Turkey agrees, Canada agrees. China. So when they therefore want to have a cross-cultural dialogue uh, about privacy and confidentiality, they don't need to do start by discussing do we respect privacy or confidentiality. They actually can start, we accept privacy and confidentiality, but how do we do it? How much do we accept it? What is vulnerability? What is social responsibility? So we at least accept that. Now, one of the challenges that I'll come up later in the talk, a talk about the United Nations, um, one of the challenges we have is some topics are not in this declaration because we do not have agreement. We do not have agreement on abortion. We do not have agreement on euthanasia. We do not have agreement on animal rights. These are topics where we have quite varied opinions in different nations of the world. But these guiding ethical principles, we have some agreement. So, for example, Article 8, respect for human vulnerability and personal integrity in applying and advancing scientific knowledge, medical practice, and associated technologies, 
human vulnerability should be taken into account. Individuals and groups of special vulnerability should be protected and the personal integrity of such individuals respected. So we have a vulnerability. When you are working as a health professional, you come across many people who don't really want to be in the emergency room. They are very vulnerable. Can they make decisions? Sometimes they can. Sometimes they bring in their family members who have different opinions to them. And sometimes they make the wrong choices. So how do we, you know, respecting vulnerability is really important. Because when we're vulnerable, we don't always make a good decision. Social responsibility and health. So this was actually uh, quite an interesting article if we go down to the second part of it. We should have access to quality health care and essential medicines. So right to health care. Number two, access to adequate nutrition and water, food and water. Three, improvement of living conditions in the environment. Four, elimination of the marginalization and exclusion of persons on the basis of any grounds. And five, reduction of poverty and literacy. So, bioethics, what is it? It is access to medicines, right to food, right to water, right to a house, right to living conditions, right to not being excluded, <coughs> right to not being in poverty, the right to education. So it's a much broader concept. We know that health requires all these things. A third way to view ethics, we have descriptive, we have prescriptive, third way is interactive. Discussion and debate between people, groups within society and communities, such dialogue skills are necessary to live harmoniously with others. And we don't always live harmoniously, but if we have skills to do so, we could. Freedom of expression is quite critical to ensuring all have moral responsibility. And Article 19 of the 1948 Universal Declaration of, Bio of Human Rights upholds freedom to hold opinions without interference. So you can think whatever you have without interference by the government. And we repeated this in uh, the 1997 Declaration on the Imaginum of Human Rights. States should undertake to facilitate on this subject an open ex international discussion, ensuring free expression of various social, cultural, religious, and philosophical opinions. So, in bioethics, we should discuss every subject and every view. Sometimes those views are not politically correct, they are not religiously correct, they are intellectually free. So in the bioethics class is the place or the space where we think everything. Sometimes where we say things that we are not meant to say in public. We were meant to question things that we're not meant to question in public. But this is the space. Um, we established in 1995 the Asian Bioethics Association and the Constitution is to try to have open and international exchange of ideas among those working in bioethics in various fields of study in different regions of the world. So we try to encourage, one, to organize and support international conferences in bioethics in Asia, two, to assist the development and linkage of regional organizations for bioethics, three, to encourage other academic and educational work or projects. Okay. When I first moved in 1990 to live in Japan um, and I know that 1990 is before some of you were born you know you may have been in a previous life as a tree or a monarch butterfly or a soul in some formulation of God's creation plan but what I found in the bioethics in Japan is people were only taking an American textbook and translating this into Japanese. Or taking a, a German philosophy book and translating it into Japanese. 
Yet there was such a rich heritage of traditional thinking in Japan. Now, what I did further in, from 2004 to 2013, for 10 years I was regional advisor for UNESCO, for Asia Pacific. So my region covered from Iran through Central Asia to Japan and the Pacific Islands, including my home country of Aotearoa. And so many of the philosophers, people there, so if I go to, went to Cambodia, the School of Philosophy, to try and develop it, I would ask the students, name 10 Cambodian philosophers. And most of them could not, because they only studied in high school European philosophers plus Confucius and Gandhi, and that's it. And maybe, you know, Avicenna, yeah, who, yeah, Avicenna, who's either Turkish or, you know, or Persian, depending where you come from, or maybe they discuss Rumi, who might be from your hometown or from, you know, but very few. So how do we reestablish a knowledge of our wisdom in a post-colonial or decolonial view? So critical thinking is essential for empowering persons. And how do we promote the creation of ideas and individuality in an era of globalization? The systems and patterns that were seen in relationships between patients, families, health professionals, and society in general have changed and are changing. And Critical thinking is really critical. Much of my life's work has been to educate citizens of the world in schools, from preschool, primary school, secondary school, to think for themselves to make choices. So, bioethics education from the bottom up, so to speak. I also because there was a lot of work from the top down of professional education of ethics, that people need to be able to make choices. In my home uh, part of the world in the Pacific, we have a tradition of dialogue. We have community meetings to decide decisions. This is the norm. Over history, how do we deal with this diversity of descriptive ethics that we have different views? So one approach is the Great Wall of China. We build a wall around ourselves. Another way is, is a, a Maori meeting house, it's called a Marae. It's a place for community to meet together and discuss their opinions in order to reach consensus. A process in the Maori meeting room is people sit in a large circle. The person, the youngest, speak first. Okay? Youngest, who's the youngest in the room? Is it me? Am I youngest? Maybe I'm younger than you, I don't know. Maybe in my mind. Uh, my dreams. But the, the youngest speak first. At the end, the chief speaks. Everyone speaks. And they express their opinion. And at the end, the chief's function is to, in a sense, build on everyone's ideas, make a consensus statement, and see if there are consensus has been formed. This is quite a different role from many forms of paternalistic community decision making yeah, that exist in the world. We're often only the uh, oldest people or the most powerful people make a comment and young people are all quiet. Another one, uh, how do we all diversity is to make a bridge. Practical bioethics, let's go to that, because it is to try to make the world more bioethical. For example, health projects for medically deprived populations and environmental activism. And I'm going to talk about some different questions now as examples. <coughs> what happens when we disagree? Do you always agree with everybody? No. I hope not. No. We could respectively disagree. <coughs> we can try to convert. 
to your point of view. I used to organize inter-religious meetings and sometimes some of my dear friends from different religions were more interested in conversion than in dialogue. It was sort of a bit sad, because for me I'm interested in dialogue, but for them they're interested in conversion, which is uh, interesting. The third way, when we disagree, is fight a war. And we're going to come back to this question, which is extremely disturbing for me, and I'm sure for most of you, at the moment. We could ignore, and sometimes ignorance is, ignoring is <laughs> sometimes is better than certainly than fighting a war. Dialogue with an open mind. These are two pictures from Hiroshima, the first use of atomic bomb in war. Okay? So, on that side you see the mushroom cloud. Does anybody know what this is a picture of? Do you know what this is? A mushroom bomb. Uh, the cloud is here. Mushroom bomb. It's on the staircase. Okay. This is what happens to a person under a nuclear bomb. This is a shadow on concrete steps. The person was waiting for the bank to open, and uh, unfortunately, the bank didn't open before they were made into a shadow. So, nuclear weapons war, this is not, we can no longer fight wars as a rational being. International justice, in quotation marks, at the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal, 17 physicians were convicted for excesses during experimental research on thousands of human beings in Nazi concentration camps. Nuremberg trials were important for prescription. It's an important moment. You probably study about this in medical ethics. What you may not study is the hypocrisy. So the Nazi physicists and rocket scientists were made U.S. citizens to establish NASA. Okay? An interesting, uh, you know, we have some films like Oppenheimer was a very interesting film. <coughs> Japanese biomedical researchers in Unit 731 were given exemption for sharing their results of the V-section experiments for the starting the U.S. biowarfare programs. The ethics guidelines used to convict Nazi doctors were not actually being applied in USA, both with civilian experiments on the A-bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and many medical experiments in the USA. So the, the same guidelines that were being used were not actually uh, being applied by the people. A famous uh, example of a you may have learned is the Tuskegee syphilis study. Syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease treatable by penicillin. Since 1932 to 1972, an experiment about the natural history of syphilis in Negro men without penicillin prescription USA. It was approved by ethics committees until 1972. In 1945, at the end of the war, penicillin became readily available. It was readily known that this was going to cure syphilis, but they let these black men die. And you can calculate 1945 to 1972. 40 years. 30 years. Long time. Infectious disease. It may be interesting for you the or development of which method of syphilis testing would be used was actually developed in the research by the U.S. National Research Council, American Medical Association, and the Guatemalan government in Guatemala from 1946 to 48. Their experiments were on orphans, prisoners, mentally handicapped persons, soldiers, prostitutes, and you know, and others. Um, and that is how we decided what tests and syphilis to use. 
medical doctors usually bring a medicines pouch. Do you have a medical pouch? You go as a medical professional. This is a, a cool medical pouch, don't you think? When you go to your patient with this medical pouch, you'll be fine. So, it's based on the evidence of some peer-reviewed papers or a long history of practical use. Um, all medicines need evidence. Another way to deal with diversity is uh, battleship diplomacy. If you come to Los Angeles, where I live, and look, you'll see you can go on the USS Iowa, one of the largest battleships in the world, and for all of history, the most powerful military force has allowed countries to promote their ideas and colonize others. I just went this morning to the uh, museum in your dear town, and the last floor you see is about Turkish independence with battleships in the harbor. Yeah. And phosphorus and others. Next to the battleship, however, on the other side of the river is a container ship terminal, which offers hope because containers are our basic method of transnational trade. We ship everything in containers. Exploiting, but when we read about it, it actually means we can exploit cheap labor markets, which raises many questions. <coughs> Do you want to have child labor making your clothes? Do you want to wear diamonds made from child <coughs> slaves in uh, diamond mines? Or wear gold that's extracted from gold mines that use chemicals to kill indigenous people? Okay, there you go. Well, I don't wear gold. Mm, yeah, and never mind. Um, it doesn't mean that I use, a, I use a laptop which has rare metals, and I use a telephone, which has rare earths, and uh, of course these come from the same places. So, we're living through the COVID pandemic, which shook the fabric of social ethics and perceptions of global citizenship. Um, for most of human history until the past few decades, life was granted as a privilege, not something to be taken for granted. And with COVID-19, we saw the return of infectious disease as a major determinant for life and death, even for those in rich countries. And we saw the return into poverty of at least a billion lives. I spent 20 years of my life on international human development. We lost 20, well, 15 years at least of human development work in the pandemic. Well, we hopefully will do it better in the next 15 years, but we'll see. What's a place of love in the uh, face of early death? All these sorts of questions. So we established this uh, uh, public statements on the uh, uh, pandemic. And uh, these are various statements we can get. Various recommendations. COVID-19 vaccines are global public goods. Okay, how do we make that? Receiving an immunization during a public health emergency can be a moral responsibility. You get an experimental vaccine, it's a moral responsibility? Maybe. Should the immunization programs be mandatory or voluntary? Individual autonomy. So you can find all these resources on the web. There's a lot. But the exercise of autonomy and responsibility requires some basic political, economic, social, and educational conditions. If we have autonomy, we also have responsibility. So loving a thing means wanting it to live. So we saw examples. The words of Confucius were applied very strict public health lockdowns, in, for example, in China. They compared us and they said, the Chinese then said for a while, well, we're much better, we respect the love of life, therefore we're totally locking down our country and cities. And the Brazilians, the Indians, and the US <coughs> citizens, 
they don't respect life and they let hundreds of thousands of people die. Maybe New Zealand, they also have this total lockdown. Another example, organ donation. This is a Japanese angel, okay? Yeah. Looks a bit Western, but anyway, this is the organ donation card. Are you an organ donor? Is this a responsibility? Opting in, opting out. Do we have an organ donation rule? That opts in, meaning you have to choose to be in, or you have a law which opts out, meaning you choose to be out. Is your consent? In Singapore, it's opting out. In Japan, it's opting in. In Iran, oral consent can be confirmed by one of the family members. So you don't need written consent. It's, it makes it a little bit easier. Incentives. Do we thank organ donors? Okay, so we have a thank you fund in Japan, or in Iran, a certain amount of money is a social gift. In Singapore, if you're an organ donor, you get the priority for the health treatment in the waiting list at the hospital, or for you can get a benefit. New issues such as legal and ethical, legal, social issues of genetically modified disease vectors in public health, GM mosquitoes. It has a few bits still. Yep. <coughs> yep. So some reproductive ethics dilemmas before you think about some questions. Dilemmas such as abortion, sex selection, reproduction. So these questions. If I can enhance my house, can I enhance my body? Who can limit my choice? Should we get thinner? Should we get taller? Should we get whiter? <coughs> Whitening cream. Very interesting eugenic and social uh, attitude. Is curing a disease of active love? So these are all sorts of questions. There are so many. Um, I'd like you to think about. Um, this is a photocopy machine. The space underneath is for a wheelchair user. In the office, if we want to make our office for people who have wheelchairs, so we can accept people with different abilities working. I'm going to just uh, go over to the last slide, which is the website, to, so we have time for some questions. What's the pursuit of a good life? How do we define a good life? Who defines a good life for you and for me? Um, I was going to talk a little about UN reform, if you want to ask questions. Um, American University of Sovereign Nations, we sort of, we are a graduate program. Our first graduation is in the Asia-Africa Summit Hall in Bandung, Indonesia. Um, if you want to ask how it affected me to do bioethics workshops in Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza, or in uh, Indonesia or India or Russia or wherever I've been, all these countries explore these similar sort of questions. So how do we do that? It's really important. Um, sliders. So you're welcome to join us. You can find more resources on here. Uh, perhaps you have time for a few questions. Thank you very much. I hope I opened up some processes in our minds together. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to ask, is there any question? I think here our students and our colleagues has many, many questions in their minds, but I would try to uh, make them uh, courage to ask them today of here in the youngest teacher. Thank you so much. <coughs> Actually, a short question. Uh, I'm curious about what is the source of 
ethics or bioethics? I think the source I consider it as a biological heritage, a social heritage, and a spiritual heritage. So, biologically, as living organisms, we had to live with other beings. So, we needed to cooperate. And I, I, I'm deliberately not saying as people. We see ethics in, is a, I believe it's a pre-human concept for uh, organisms. Y humans have developed some cultures or communities which have tried to articulate this in different ways, often repeating some of the same things, like uh, autonomy, justice, and religious rules or biological rules. Um, I see it as a spiritual heritage. Um, the fact that we feel concern or love for people in need or who are sick or hungry. This is a common, in a decent, you know, a regular person's heart. They see that and we want to help. Um, and this is the social, as a socio-biological or evolutionary role, it's much more advantageous for our reproductive success to help others. So I don't see, all these three aspects are important, I think, equally. Um, and I see answers to this in every community that we go to. You know, but many are very, each community, each culture has found a solution. Um, and often some common aspects. They will help sick people. You know, um, but it's a regular common sense of a Human being. Thank you very much, Daryl. And one, uh, just one question here. What do you think about uh, black box algorithm in medicine, uh, especially uh, psychology? Please repeat. What um, black box algorithm in medicine. What do you think, um, especially psychology? I may explain. What do you think about artificial intelligence yes. in medicine and especially in psychology? In psychology, well, it, maybe not just in psychology, but maybe from a psychological point of view. I, it's, it can enhance our wisdom to make a better, give better advice to people. Um, it, will it confuse us is a question. I hope that we tailor our use of AI for helping us make decisions that are consistent with our values. But it's also going to be, so first thinking, I think in medicine for the patient and professional. We can think in the end of professionals who are AI systems. Yeah, it will be very useful. Ultimately, we will have persons who are AI creations who I will respect as persons. And we will, maybe it will be ironic that eventually we may have human physicians for AI patients. Okay? Yes. Uh, or, but right now we're at the phase where I think it can enhance us. We have the challenges for us to avoid prescriptive ethics that we allow the diversity. Because if you have so much knowledge, which you know, AI system will gather so much knowledge that it, it may seem obvious to make choice A. But we are crazy human beings and we sometimes make choice D or E, even though it seems counter. But that's what it is to be human. So, can we put this in AI systems? I don't know. But I think AI can help us reflect. It may, it can be helpful. But our danger, I think, is to f forget what it is to be, make the, sometimes the, the apparently incorrect choice. And some, some decisions like, uh, it may not help us. So for example, uh, I'm a young medical student, I'm a woman, I get pregnant, I'm not married, 
should I have an abortion or not, AI is not going to help me. It's going to be my choice about what I do. Because uh, I used to work in Thailand. In that case, university students who got pregnant were expelled from the university. Okay? So that law was changed. But AI doesn't help. Euthanasia, my dear mother is dying of cancer. Should I give her an extra dose of morphine to die quickly or not? AI is not going to help us, but it may give us the information to make choices if we allow time for it. So I, it can help us, but I think we need to be careful. I don't know what you think. Thank you so much, Daniel. And one more question. Thank you for uh, your uh, excellent uh, speech, uh, dear Professor uh, Mason. Uh, uh, one or two weeks ago, there was a discussion in our country uh, and uh, two, uh, uh, two points of our country came across. Uh, the one side is a judge and the one side is a minister of health for taking heel bloods uh, for uh, a newborn uh, baby. Uh, the family uh, don't, uh, don't, uh, didn't want to uh, uh, health professionals to take uh, their babies blood hell, heal blood hell, uh, but uh, our, uh, in our country uh, heal blood uh, screening is important because we are screen, uh, we, uh, we screen uh, penit catenary uh, or uh, uh, lots of other disease. So uh, I want to, um, the judge ruled out that uh, uh, the baby's uh, heal blood cannot be taken uh, because they uh, don't want to, uh, uh, their babies to be uh, do, uh, do, uh, to be done uh, this uh, test. Uh, what do you think about on this topic? I really uh, mm. wonder. Topic, um, I think because uh, sorry, I, I would if when it catenary disease, uh, that uh, if I have a hypotrophy disease, uh, we don't if we uh, don't screen them, the babies will be uh, mental motor development delay. So, uh, what is the ethical <laughs> approach is the uh, most uh, right one. Thank you. So, can we override the parent's ultimate autonomy? And I think, for me, I would probably, if I was a judge, I would say, I would agree, you cannot override the parent's autonomy unless there's a reasonable doubt about the health of a baby. So if there's any early sign of the health, they should be helped. But for, you know, routine neonatal blood taking is a recent medical benefit for us. It's, I think it's a reasonable, that we take it. Yeah, yeah. But if parents are strongly objecting to this, but the funny thing is, you know, it's just uh, taking a couple of drops of blood and it doesn't cause any harm. So, uh, I, whether they should, you know, take it without the consent or knowledge of the parent when they go to the routine clinic is another option. <laughs> yeah, because it's easy just to take a blood. Uh, but my judgment, I guess I would say, we have to go with what the judge has said. If there's no evidence of any sign of that disease in the, the newborn baby, which is already too young to probably see any sign, then I, I think they made the right decision. But uh, I think education of the parents about the benefits of the health could continue and maybe in a few weeks time they change their mind and they talk to the parents and educate them about, you know, this doesn't really hurt them. Are they afraid of national security concerns about being ID'd or, you know, why are they afraid of taking the blood? Um, yeah, it's sort of, so somehow I talk with the parents, but I don't think we can force it, I, I agree. Um, there's no reason to force against the parents, but with education most parents will agree with it. Okay. Thank you very much, Daniel. And let's uh, go on a discussion after the program. I see your hand, but let's uh, go on discussion after the program.
And now, now I would like to invite, invite our dean for to give a, a present in the memory of this for to <laughs> Professor David Mason. Thank you very much, all of you, for attending this conference. Okay, thank you.